Welcome to another episode of Wealth Uncensored. I'm joined today by David Pising in Guernsey. He's a personal fiduciary that's been in the trust and wealth planning business for how many years, David? About 40 years. Yep. 40 years. Okay. So why don't you give us a little bit of background on yourself so our, our listeners know a little bit more about you and your experience in this area. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. Let's dive into today's show. Sure. Thanks, Jimmy. I've been in, let's say, in the trust industry almost exclusively in Guernsey for, for most of the 40 years. I spent a couple of years out in working in Cayman and in uh, Hong Kong, but the rest of the time I've been in Guernsey. For the last 30 years of my corporate career, which ended, which moved from 93 until 2023, I was with a very large independent trust group, which ended up being listed on a stock exchange and went right through from it being a small business to a, a large business, ending up with about five to 600 people worldwide at, at one point. But yeah, I've had years of experience of working with ultra high net worth clients from all over the world, from every type of background and right up to very high levels of, of wealth with global assets. So I've seen a lot of interesting and varied trust structures and corporate structures over those years. All right, David. So today we're going to be talking about choice of jurisdiction. This is myself as a planning professional, and I'm sure you get this question all the time when you work with clients is, what's the best jurisdiction? Where should I put my trust or foundation? What's the best jurisdiction? And that's obviously a question that can't be answered because there's not best jurisdiction. It's what's best for the client. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about what some of the things are that you see or you consider in a client's case as how to choose the right jurisdiction for them. What are some of the things that they should be considering? Well, I think probably the most important starting point is which of the jurisdictions to avoid. There are a cluster of top jurisdictions where it almost doesn't matter to, to an extent which one of those you might choose. But it's important to avoid the ones that are going to cause you practical difficulty. And in the last sort of decade or so, with all this grey listing and blacklisting from OECD and EU, you need to avoid the sort of jurisdictions which keep cropping up on those grey lists and blacklists because the practical problems that you face by having assets held by a corporate structure in a jurisdiction that is on a grey list or a blacklist are completely paralyzing in, in terms of what you can do with that structure. You can't open a bank account or you might find your bank account gets frozen. At the very best, you are going to be faced with increased levels of compliance costs because the questions you will get asked by a bank, for example, you just can't open a bank account and say that bank account gets frozen. And the compliance departments of every bank work very closely with those grey lists and black lists. And it's an automatic trigger for them. Any entity owning a, any clients connected with that jurisdiction immediately goes on to a watch list and a, and a red flag. And you need a, an urgent transaction done. It'll take maybe weeks rather than days. Or if money is coming into the bank account from a, a jurisdiction, which is now on the grey list. And we even saw this with Cayman. And Cayman was on the grey list for about 18 months or so. Anyone with a Cayman stru linked structure, automatically, within 24 hours, the regulators in mainstream offshore jurisdictions were saying, you need to treat Cayman as high risk. And that just passes layers and layers of cost on, onto the structure. So the sorts of jurisdictions which are typically older structures where maybe an asset has been held in that structure for years. It could be one of my old favourites in terms of it never really being easy to deal with, Liberia. There's Liberian companies out there. You find the Marshall Islands crops up from time to time. You'll see Seychelles cropping up quite a lot. 
Turks and Caicos, occasionally Belize, uh, and then of course Panama, which Panama Papers blew apart, and obviously that became really difficult. And those jurisdictions are really problematic. So almost take those out of where you would want to set up a new structure today. Yeah, I, I would add to that potential to that list potentially Nevis and, and Cook Islands, both of which have tremendous trust laws with great asset protection. But as as you said. I sometimes have people come to me and they're like, oh, I want to set up a Nevis Trust or a Cook Islands Trust. It's never been broken. But it's as you said, it's the practical issues, the banking. One, as you mentioned, the transactions are more difficult, but getting a bank account to begin with, unless this trust has a significant amount of money and not even Swiss banks are going to touch it, right? Unless you're right, correct. $50 million into the account or something, not even a Swiss bank's going to, going to touch it, which means you're dealing with at best, a local bank, which usually don't have the best customer service. And, and I've actually even seen issues beyond banking, right, where you had at the top of the structure trust in, in one of these jurisdictions and layers down, you know, a company is being sold in the EU. And when the buyer of that company has done their due diligence on the structure for a multi-million dollar sale of a structure, and they see it's owned on the back end by one of these very offshore structures. That's caused problems in the sale process. Correct. Absolutely. Yep. Like, Very much. So I think you're 100% right uh, in that analysis is where not to go because it's very yep. yep. And I think then you get into sort of a next tier up where you've got jurisdictions which occasionally get onto a grey list or they get threatened with going on a grey list um, and they might be on it for a brief period and it might be just a technicality and you'd include perhaps in there maybe the Bahamas which was formerly a British dependency, obviously went independent in the 1970s, but it has got on and off uh, grey lists uh, from time to time. You get, uh, probably should have mentioned it in the first group, actually, somewhere like Vanuatu, uh, which I think is now on a uh, is now on a grey list. Um, you, Samoa uh, would be there. Some of these jurisdictions that also do have a bit of an advantage that they've got very flexible corporate law that enables you to redomicile a company out of the jurisdiction very easily. So if there is a problem with that jurisdiction, you can simply redomicile. And it's the jurisdictions where you can't redomicile or where, for example, real estate is owned by the, the vehicle where it's just too problematic to get things to get things changed. But then you start to hit the what I call the almost like the gold list of jurisdictions, the ones that consistently are very well regulated. They do everything. They meet every regulatory challenge head on. I have to say this has been a th one of the biggest changes that I've seen in my career. I remember when, I think it was 1989 or 1990, that Guernsey introduced its first regulator. The Guernsey Financial Services Commission started came into being and started regulating businesses. And gradually, the level of regulatory compliance burden rose. And there was undoubtedly a period when a lot of people in the industry would question, really, where is all this going? Is it going too far? And I think we're now at a stage globally where what appeared to be a very high level of regulation um, uh, and, and a huge regulatory burden is probably now reaping dividends because now people only, the, the, the best advised clients will now always only choose a one of the top rated jurisdictions where you're not going to experience these issues with the lesser regulated jurisdictions. Cayman, I think, has been unfortunate to have got on a grey list for a while and, of course, it managed to get off. But G Guernsey, Jersey, Bermuda... Switzerland is now regulating fiduciaries, which of course it didn't until I think 2022. You've got a sort of a, 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 a growing list of jurisdictions where the, the, the governments and the regulator, they realise what impact there would be to get on a grey list and you need to stay off it. If offshore jurisdictions want to stay playing the game, they've got to adhere to the rules being set by those who set them, whether they agree with them or not, because you can't fight those battles. You can make a case, but you're up against the multinational bodies that are not going to you know, be easily swayed. But luckily, you have these independent evaluators like MoneyVal, 
and they are independents. I know their agenda is set by the OECD, but you get a very objective investigation and a very thorough one. And I know having Guernsey has just gone through it, Jersey's just had its results announced. They're six months ahead of the process, so they had a clean bill of health. And it keeps the jurisdictions on their on their toes. I think I'm right in saying Monaco also got onto, may have got onto a grey list recently, or has been warned that it's about, it, it could get on the grey list very quickly if it's not careful. And, and so jurisdictions are always upping their game. And what it means is that the knock-on impact is that the level of regulation is high. The cost, therefore, of imposing that regulatory burden on regulated businesses is very high. And it means that the entry threshold for setting up a structure in those jurisdictions is high. And you will have clients who simply say, look, that's just too much. I can't, my structure won't bear that. And they have a choice. They either have to pay it, and it may not be economically viable for them to do so, or they have to compromise in the quality of jurisdiction that they then use. Well, that's a difficult choice. I think you're 100%. I remember when I first started off in this business 20 years ago, if you had a couple million dollars and you wanted to stick it in an offshore trust somewhere, that was something that was absolutely doable. You could just find a trustee in most jurisdictions that would do almost, they weren't regulated or, or the regulation was very light. Maybe it cost five grand a year and they'd pretty much just do whatever you say and, and, and stay out of your business and execute whatever transactions you wanted. Whereas now I, I look at it where unless you're going to put 10 million in a trust and, and that 10 million is generating enough income to cover the cost of the structure and then some, you're priced out of the market or, or at least priced out of a well-regulated market. So the the barrier to entry to get the advantages that these structures offer has is, is greatly increased. I think it's somewhat a double-edged sword. I, I get really annoyed with all this regulation because a lot of it, especially on the compliance side, you start fighting with compliance officers because they couldn't see an edge of a passport or something. It's, it's just moronic. But I think the good impact of what the regulation has had is that if you go into a well-regulated jurisdiction, yes, you have to deal with a higher compliance burden. Yes, for example, getting on with a getting on boarded with a trustee is going to require a deeper dive into your life on, on the client due diligence. But the upside, which I think is very valuable, is that if you do business with a trustee, let's say in, in Guernsey, for example, you can be confident that this is a well-regulated entity and that the trustee is not going to go disappear with your money, right? Which, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you didn't really have that sort of level of, of security, right? You were just taking your best guess. Whereas with the regula regulation now, with insurance requirements and regulatory and capitalization requirements and all of this stuff, when you go to a well-regulated jurisdiction, you definitely have, you know, some comfort that nobody's going to take off with your money or, or grossly mismanage it or, or something like that, which I think, you know, obviously has a lot of value. Absolutely. And I think the real evidence of all of this is the number of fiduciary businesses which get hit with large fines. Senior directors of those businesses get banned from the industry for sometimes six, eight years, which is... And I think clients will take great comfort from the fact that the regulator is doing things like that and weeding out people who the regulator doesn't believe meet meet the standards. And of course, a lot of the stuff that comes to light is legacy business from maybe 10, 15 years ago when standards were not so high. And you constantly come up against this issue that operators today are often being judged against standards of today for things that they did 10, 15 years ago when those standards weren't in force. And that's quite a difficult thing to do with old structures. You have to remediate them and bring them up to today's standards. And some clients just say, well, this is nonsense. I don't need to do this so I can move it to another jurisdiction. You think, well, yeah, you can, but the good jurisdictions will all catch up. And I think you're right. It gives you that security. That business is under the microscope, a regulator that's looking for deficiencies in the way that business is actually run. And I think it's fair to say, and certainly the experience I've, I've noticed over the last decade or so with the 
the enforcement action, certainly in Guernsey and Jersey, that's been taken by the regulator as a business, you don't get struck out on day one, right? You've made an error. You've got a deficiency. You will get visits that give you warnings and you are told very clearly what you need to address. And frankly, if two or three years later, the regulator is coming back and you have not addressed those shortcomings, then you've only really got yourselves to blame for for not taking the regulator seriously. And you'd have to do something really serious as a one-off action to get closed down or banned out of the blue. You'll get plenty of warning. And, And I think anybody who has turned a blind eye to the regulator and argued with the regulator and they're not going to win that battle. Therefore, you end up with this sort of reduced number of operators, but all of whom can be confident that those businesses are as well regulated as they possibly can be. And I heard a very interesting comment recently. There's been a couple of enforcements announced in Guernsey in the last month or two, where the commentator was saying it just goes to show that there are there's business in these jurisdictions which you know, the, the, the cries of a war all clean, war all innocent are, are ill-founded. To me, it's an endorsement that regulation is actually working because if there are legacy structures there from years ago that are causing a problem, not weeding them out doesn't get rid of the problem. But I see it as a very positive thing. And I think a lot of people in the industry, from the, the daily frustration of having to work within it, is now more than offset by the dividend, if you like, of being rubber stamped as being a well-regulated business in a well-regulated jurisdiction because good business will migrate to those jurisdictions. For sure. And I, I would add to that somewhat related when you're evaluating which jurisdiction to choose, this is closely related to, to the regulatory thing and having good business there, is that you have good professionals to work with there. And not just one or two, but that you have a pool to choose from in terms of lawyers, accountants, tax advisors, trustees, I mean, you always need to find a professional where the personalities fit and you're like-minded and you get to get along with them. And you need a, a good pool of highly experienced and educated professionals to assist with whatever you need with your structure. This is one of the things when we talk about some of the super offshore jurisdictions. I had a case last year where I had a client, I'm not going to call out the jurisdiction by name, but it was a very offshore jurisdiction and, and he was adamant that he wanted a structure there. And we were trying to set up a foundation and we couldn't find a lawyer that could draft a decent foundation. We tried a few different ones and every single foundation document that I got back to review was just garbage. It was basically a template that somebody had drafted. When you told them what you actually wanted the the foundation to say, like they were incapable of getting it done. Um, that's something, who, and, and the, this country I will call out, that's something that you see in Panama quite a bit. They, they're, it's very hard to find good professionals in Panama. Everything, and, and this is another point, is what language does the jurisdiction speak? Because you go down to Panama, everything needs to be done in Spanish. You're, you're going to incur a lot of costs in getting documents translated. Yeah, and there's also a requirement in several jurisdictions to get everything notarized before it's even accepted. A certified true copy is not acceptable. Uh, I've had calls recently to try and verify documents in Cayman. And actually, they've got a really interesting system now where the original document certified by the registry, they see the original, they certify it, they put it on their registry and they give it a reference code. You can check the validity of the certified document that you've been sent and it's been independently verified by the registry to say, yes, that this matches the original document. And I can't help thinking that sort of system is something that will or should become more widespread. I'd love to see a ultimately a situation where if you've been verified by one of the top ranked jurisdictions as your passport ID has been signed off, your your address verification's been signed off, you could almost then be like passported into other jurisdictions where that certification will be treated as having been verified to the highest possible level. That's your passport to dealing with financial services anywhere in the world. And of course, what we see a lot of is structures where the trust and underlying companies span several jurisdictions. So if you've got a a family trust structure, 
And you might have a trust, say, in Guernsey or Jersey. You might have underlying holding companies in Luxembourg that hold European real estate and other assets. You might have a Cayman or a BVI company owning assets that are managed in Switzerland. You might have real estate and private equity structures held through un- other underlying companies in other jurisdictions. So it's one structure, but you could have five or six jurisdictions involved. But you've got to go through at the moment the, the, the due diligence process in every of the verification process in every single one of those jurisdictions. And it, it may be a pipe dream, but it would make people's lives a lot easier once you've gone if you pay once to go through this super verification process, life should become it should become easier. I think multiple jurisdictions that you'll know very well is obviously in the United States who have picked up a lot of business from, you know, when CRS was introduced, a lot of business migrated to the US. And so you look back on that now and you think, actually, if that was the only reason for going to the US was to avoid CRS, I know there were some lawyers in different states of the US who said, we can't deal with those clients if that's their sole reason for coming here, because what are they hiding? And I think that era has now pretty much gone. But what it has done is it's brought to light the real debate between privacy, secrecy, and confidentiality, and this right to privacy, which you lose in some... You've got the whole debate going on now about public beneficial ownership registers of, of, of companies. And, of course, the, the very well-regulated jurisdictions are saying, we don't need and we don't want a public access register. What we want is a register that law enforcement officers and tax officials can access if they need to. They have no barrier. But we don't want prying journalists sitting in a registry office pouring through names of companies because they don't need to know. They want to know, but they don't need to know. I may be wrong, but I suspect the US will probably be the very last jurisdiction. I know some states have perhaps gone a bit closer to this, but having public beneficial ownership registers i I don't think the u.s is going to implement a public beneficial owner register i don't see that happening but i'll tell you what is interesting when you bring up the united states because the united states is the combination of a well-regulated jurisdiction with very low due diligence if the regulation of lawyers for example in the u.s is very high they have to maintain a very high level of, of professional responsibility and if they don't they're going to be in trouble with the bar and get suspended. In some states, I think the lawyers are required to have professional liability insurance. Even And when you look at professional trust companies, most states require them to have a, a very high capitalization, several hundred thousand dollars, I think at a minimum in some states, and insurance and show that what you're doing. But for example, if you want to hire a lawyer in the US, I mean, you don't even have to show your ID. Mm-hmm. You can go in and give them money. The requirements in, in the U.S. in terms of client due diligence is pretty much nil at the moment. Now, they're, they're obviously talking about changing that, but I'm aware that some people wanted to go to the U.S. Uh, because of the CRS issues. But I think that a lot of people chose to go to the U.S. just because it's easier to do business there. Getting on board with a lawyer takes 10 minutes, not a month. Getting on board with a trustee is maybe a week rather than two months. And also getting bank accounts. Very easy. Stuff like that is, is, is much easier. I, I think the CRS thing was, with many people, sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the last thing that they're like, you know what, there's greener pastures. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the U.S. Yeah, I mean, if your underlying assets are going to be banked in the US, you might have an investment portfolio or something, then you've set up a Delaware company and you can get that open pretty quickly. But if you want to open a bank account for a Delaware company in Switzerland, for example, are the Swiss banks going to look at this low level of regulation in the US and say, you know what, this isn't good enough for us now? I don't know. It's all changing, isn't it, in Switzerland? The experience that I've had is normally not that somebody's setting up a Delaware company. The experience that I had is usually people are setting up a trust or foundation somewhere like Wyoming or Nevada or Delaware. And then that trust winds up owning companies all over the world in Europe. I haven't seen that having a, a U.S. structure because of how lightly it's regulated, let's say, 
has caused issues where a Swiss bank has said, no, we're not going to do business with this. But they certainly have to do their due diligence on the structure. But one of the things with the U.S. structures that very few people know is that you can set up a U.S. trust that's taxed as a foreign trust. And so you wind up not having to pay any U.S. taxes. But what a lot of people miss is that although the trust is foreign for income tax purposes, it is not foreign for purposes of the FBAR, which is the foreign yeah. bank account reporting. So the U.S. trusts, if it owned, let's say, for example, more than 50% of a Luxembourg company, it would need to report that Luxembourg company's bank accounts on the U.S. trust's FBAR. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the trustee of many U.S. trusts can be an unregulated family private trust company in, I think, Wyoming and Nevada are probably the two most popular. I think you have to be a regulated private trust company in South Dakota or New Hampshire, for example. We hear a lot about Wyoming and Nevada family PTCs, um, where the underlying trust is a U.S. foreign trust, and there's no regulation in the U.S. at all. I think a lot of people get surprised by that. And you can see why it's very appealing, because then that structure might then be administered out of Guernsey, Jersey, Cayman, wherever, because it's an easier structure to maintain. I think there's more and more of that going on at the moment. I come across Wyoming trusts quite a lot, and I don't see that trend really slowing down. So, yeah, the choice of jurisdictions out there is, is endless. But what we haven't mentioned, of course, is places like Singapore, Hong Kong even, UAE, with the foundations and in DIFC and in the ADGM, all very popular now. Uh, I see some really interesting attractions about the DIFC and ADGM foundations and structures because they're very late comers to the international private wealth industry in many respects. Yes, there's been use of foreign trusts and use of foreign companies in in that part of the world for a long time, but not necessarily local structures. And when you arrive in an industry at a time where very high levels of uh, regulation are going on in respect of historic legacy business, and you've got no legacy business, it becomes a lot easier to build a very robust industry to modern standards with, with, without all that baggage. And I think with double tax treaty networks and increasing, I don't know how extensive the regulation is now in DIFC and ADGM or how it is viewed, but I don't think it's light touch and, uh, from everything I'm hearing. And it seems to me that the newer jurisdictions who've got substance have got a, a really big future. What I think is a little bit different in in the UAE, for example, compared to other jurisdictions, is if you want to set up, let's say, a foundation in DIFC, you need to get approved by the DIFC. Whereas some place like Guernsey, for example, if you want to set up a foundation in Guernsey, you need to be approved by your corporate service provider, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's the big difference is that whatever you're setting up in the DIFC or ADGM or RAC ICC for that matter, you need to get it approved by that free zone. So you have to get approved by your company service provider. You have to get approved by the free zone where you're setting it up. And the result is a lot of times the company service providers in the UAE are somewhat more light touch in their own due diligence because that they know the free zone themselves are not going to be light touch. Yeah, yeah. Um, One issue that that I've seen is that they're very conservative, very difficult in that if there is something, let's say the client had a a negative media mention that they were involved in in a lawsuit, let's say. Maybe they even won the lawsuit. A lot of times, one of the jurisdictions in the UAE will say, oh, he had a lawsuit out, even if he won it. So a lot of times they take a super conservative approach and it takes a little bit of work to go in and and explain it to them and get them to approve it. But one of the other considerations, because we've obviously, we've talked about which jurisdictions not to use to kick off these sort of ultra offshore and and jurisdictions that might get on a gray list because of the practical problems like banking and stuff like that. We've talked about the availability of professionals. We've talked that you want a highly regulated jurisdiction, you want a jurisdiction that has a good pool of professionals. But you touched on one thing in, in the UAE, which with this tax treaty network, because 
Obviously, tax is another thing you need to consider when choosing a, a jurisdiction, right? Because most financial planning jurisdictions or trust and foundation planning jurisdictions don't have an income tax that's levied on the trusts or foundations, which is a little different from the UAE. Where the trusts aren't subject to income tax, but technically foundations are treated as corporations for purposes of the corporate income tax and would be subject to the 9%, subject to certain exceptions. But there is an election, for example, that you can make to have it treated as an unincorporated partnership, which would then get rid of that tax. But the tax treaties, I think, is a very interesting point because the UAE is the only trust and foundation planning jurisdiction that I know of that has such a large tax treaty network, and at least not always trust, but at least where foundations are able to access that treaty network most of the time. Yeah, no, that's, that is definitely a call to those for, for sure. Interestingly, because this sort of ties in when you're talking about foundations, Switzerland, which of course has been operating very much as a sort of hybrid jurisdiction from an offshore perspective, because Switzerland doesn't have a trust law and it has decided not to introduce a trust law in but recent months. It had a trust law. I think it's getting rid of its trust law because it wasn't very good, but they did have a trust law, I thought. Yeah, but they made a conscious decision to not become a mainstream trust jurisdiction yeah. and to really beef up their foundation yeah. offering well, because so, have, so many structures, we, Liechtenstein or Austrian foundations rather yeah. than Panamanian foundations rather than Swiss ones. But their treaty network will be interesting. Well, that, that's a very good point because Switzerland up until now hasn't had a private foundation law. The foundation law that they have now, as far as I understand it, is, is strictly charitable. Um, yeah. And so now with the private foundation law, you're 100% right. With the treaty network, it'll be very interesting. Mm. And you get these quite interesting jurisdictions. Malta, for example. <laughs> EU. Yep. Tick. Double tax treaty network. Ticks that box. Trusts all foundations. It's got a mixture of civil law and common law legal systems. I don't hear many people these days using Maltese foundations, but certainly I'm aware of, of some that have been formed there. You have Mauritius with a very interesting double tax treaty network. Cyprus, of course. All So many of these jurisdictions. Singapore would be another one. Very good treaty network. Horses for courses. And I think once you move up the ladder into the sort of narrowing down of which jurisdictions choose – those factors really start to come into play so that you tailor make your choice based on the specific requirements of the client. If it's simply a well-regulated trust in a nil tax jurisdiction that you want, or a foundation or a company, whatever it is, then there are some that simply have no treaties and you don't have to worry about that. But you need something that's a bit more bespoke for the jurisdictions that the structure is going to invest into. Then all these other jurisdictions come into play as well. Now, how well or how badly they are regulated is another matter. I hear from friends in Singapore, contacts in Singapore, that Singapore is now very highly regulated, but that's quite recent in terms of the trust industry. And they are trying to apply very high standards there, and you don't want to fall foul of the Singapore regulator. Hong Kong, yeah, there's a lot of Hong Kong trusts out there, but Hong Kong is China now. Do people really want their assets held at that level? Or do they want them held somewhere else? New Zealand, of course, had a decade of being incredibly popular. It wasn't on anybody's radar as a tax haven or an offshore finance center. For that reason, it attracted a lot of business. The trusts there were not really regulated. Trust companies are still not really regulated there. But of course, when New Zealand decided to beef up its regulation, that's when I think a lot of New Zealand trusts re-domiciled into the US, in particularly into to the South Dakota and Wyoming and probably Delaware as well. But of course, New Zealand was seen as ultra respectable, but it attracted perhaps some undesirable clients who thought no one's going to come looking here because this is a, a clean jurisdiction. So New Zealand, I think, had to make up its mind very quickly which way it was going to it was going to go. I do hear occasionally of New Zealand structures being, being still being used because for the right clients, they've it's got something, um, but nothing like it was ten years ago. Yep, David, this has been a very interesting conversation. I'm just going to sum up sort of a list of things that people should consider when they're thinking about which jurisdiction to choose. 
and then you let me know if I missed anything or there's anything else that, that you feel should be on the list. So I think mm-hmm. you know, the, the main thing you want to look at, is it on a gray list? What is the jurisdiction's reputation? Because that's going to have practical issues in terms of banking and potential business transactions. We, we obviously we want to look at how well it's regulated. We want a well-regulated jurisdiction so that you know that your money's going to be safe there. You want a good pool of professionals. We want to make sure that it's in a language that you can understand because potentially you're going to have to get documents translated all the time. We want to look at what are the certification requirements like you were speaking about in, in Cayman because some jurisdictions want things up will steal, some certified it's okay. And that can obviously add a lot of time and cost when you have to uh, certify documents. We want to think about how the entity is going to be taxed, whether a tax treaty network is going to be needed. One of the ones we didn't talk about, but I think is also very important, is have these structures been tested in court? And how have the courts ruled on these structures? Because I think with a lot of newer legislation or the very offshore places, they haven't really been tested. Um, and, And those are the main things that I normally look at when trying to choose jurisdictions with clients. I don't know if you have anything to to add to that. No, I I think you've covered everything well there. And that last point is, yes, it's a crucial one. How deep is the bench of lawyers? If you've got a trust structure with multiple beneficiaries and they're all suing each other and suing the trustees, there are some jurisdictions, I won't name them, but there are some where you'd struggle to find three or four law firms that could independently advise three or four different beneficiaries. You almost have to fly in qualified lawyers who are from another jurisdiction to be able to represent those clients in court there. And as you say, how strong is the legal system there? And I think it's really important to include that. Yep. David, thank you so much for your time today. It's always a pleasure. And I look forward to our next episode together the next week. Thank you, Jimmy. Thanks. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.